And Paul's writing to the Roman believers a simple letter, basically to encourage and exhort them um, and to teach them. Um, little did they know that the letter would, would be read by all the churches for thousands of years and it would bring great revivals. Wesley, uh, Luther, all transformed by this letter. Um, great um, revivals in the church. And it was carried by a woman named Phoebe, a deaconess. Um, going through this book has brought a revival to my heart. The fact that Christ has chosen me out of this world and he set um, his spirit in me, made me a child of God. I'm saved by grace through faith, not of myself. It's a gift of God, not of works lest anybody should boast. Wonderful truths that if the same spirit that dwells in Christ dwells in my body, one day he's going to quicken my mortal body and make me just like him. Wonderful, exceeding, great, and precious promises. And I'm so glad God included all of us in his plan. Now Paul's ending the letter with an exhortation for unity, an exhortation to love one another, an exhortation to edify the church of God, Jew and Gentile alike. A lot of arguments in the early church about how Jewish you should be. Uh, non-essentials, what day you're going to worship, what you're going to eat, what you're going to put on, what you wear. Um, he said the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. We should have a joy about Christ has saved us. There should be joyfulness in that. He's now explaining his ministry to the Gentiles as he's writing to the Romans. He's explaining what God's done, and he's boasting about all that God has done through him. You've got to remember, Paul used to persecute the church of Jesus Christ. He held people off at the point of a sword, separated families, did terrible things, and God stopped him and changed his life. Uh, God can take any sinner and make him a saint and make him um, fit for his kingdom and use him mightily. Um, Paul suffered many things to bring the gospel, the good news to everyone. He was stoned, beaten, outside of Lystra, Derby, uh, stoned almost to death, shipwrecked, beaten with rods, imprisoned, had false brethren always following him around. He's going to talk about here. And he said, I count all those things as nothing but to know Christ and the fellowship in his suffering. So Paul lived for eternal fruit, and he longed to reconcile both Jew and Gentile and to build the body of Christ. That's what this letter does. It should build the body of Christ. It, it should expose us and, and, and cause us to want to be more like Jesus and to see the plan of God in action as you go through the chapters. God's plan for the Jew, God's plan for the Gentile, the mystery hidden in ages past, the church, the Gentiles, all of us. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful truths that should always be held dear. A great letter to read. And a great letter to go through. I'm so glad that we took this journey. For I will not dare, verse 18, to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed, through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of God. So the Holy Spirit empowered Paul. And Paul was used to perform many miracles. When he went into a new area, God allowed Paul to do many miracles to authenticate the message that he was bringing, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This was done to set apart the message to an unbeliever, that he would know that what Paul was speaking was truth. It would sanctify the gospel. Let me read Acts 19 for you, just a couple verses. It says this, and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons. They would just take something from his body, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And it says here that Jews that saw Paul, the wonderful works that Paul was doing, they wanted to exercise demons out of somebody, and they would go to the guy that, remember the sons of Sceva, go to the guy that had the demon, and say, we, we adjure you by the, uh, what does it say here? We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Come out of him. And there were seven sons of Sceva, and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you guys? I don't know you guys. <laughs> and the spirit leaped on them, beat them up, and they were all naked, and they all ran away. They fled out of the house, so they started to fear, not Paul, but fear the message that Paul brought, fear, fear Jesus. It says this, when the, when, the, when the sons of Schema tried to do that, the name of Jesus was magnified, verse 17, Acts 19, and this was known to all the Jews and the Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of who? The Lord Jesus was magnified, and many that believed came and confessed. So 
the power of God, the Holy Spirit, the signs and the wonders caused people to come to Jesus. Listen to the gospel message. Listen to what Paul was teaching is true. It sanctified what Paul said so that they could come to Jesus and believe and they could confess their sins, show their deeds. And many of them which used occultic arts or curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men and they counted the price of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and it prevail so there was a God-given revival. The purpose of the miracles was to bring people to Jesus, to authenticate the message. Let me tell you something, the miracles cannot save you. Signs and wonders don't save you. The children of Israel had signs and wonders all the time, and they had a difficult time believing and trusting in God. They were brought out by many signs and wonders out of Egypt. So the purpose of the miracles was to make the Gentiles obedient to truth. Miracles confirmed what Paul preached. Let me read Mark 16 for you so you can understand the place that miracles have. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere. So the first thing is the message. And the Lord was working with them, confirming their message, the word, with signs following. Amen. So miracles are not the main thing. The message is. I'm not concerned about the miracle. And I'm not concerned about the person doing them. I'm concerned about what they're saying after they do them. You have to realize this. The world is scheduled to be deceived by signs and wonders. Signs and, signs and wonders don't prove anything. The, the Egyptian, the, the pharaohs, uh, 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 magicians in Egypt, they had the ability to duplicate many of uh, Moses' miracles. There's dark arts. There's occultic power. The message that Paul brought was the good news of Jesus Christ, that you can be born again. And there's power in Jesus to set you free and to transform your life. And if God gives a miracle to people that have never heard the gospel before, it's to authenticate that so they can be transformed eternally. Now, people would say, well, why are there a lot of miracles going on in the West? I can tell you one reason why. You have the Word of God. If you want to see miracles, be obedient to the Word of God you already have and watch miracles spring forth in your life all the time. The problem is we have the Word of God. We don't believe it. We don't see miracles. Miracles are going in, in, at a, in, in great fashion in the Muslim world. The Muslim world, they've been brought up to believe a lie. Allah, they've been duped. They've been deceived. People are afraid to preach the gospel. So Jesus meets them in dreams. They see miracles. People drive by with Bibles and just incredible things God's doing to authenticate that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life so that they would leave that dark religion and come into the kingdom of light. And God is granting great miracles over there on purpose. I want to see miracles in my life. Do you really? Then obey the word that you already have and you'll see miracles. I don't like that, pastor. Then don't see miracles. And that's the problem with people. Miracles aren't the main thing. Like I said, the, even him who's coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. The Antichrist is going to deceive people by miracles. And so they'll believe his message. Jesus said to the religious leaders, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign is going to be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He rose again out of that. He defeated the grave. Is that not a miracle? Did Muhammad beat the grave? Did Buddha beat the grave? You already have a miracle. I just taught you. You've seen a miracle already in your life. That should be enough. What's interesting is that we see increases in places that don't get the gospel the way we do, and we see a decrease of miracles in a place that's inundated with the gospel. So we know the truth, and the greatest sign, the greatest sign to me is a transformed life, somebody who's willing to build the body of Christ and love folks. That is the greatest sign of a miracle taking place. When I see somebody that used to be in the world and they're transformed and they're loving, it's an amazing thing because they believe, and he says, I'm not going to boast about anything except what Christ did to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. So the power of the risen Lord brings about a word and a deed to our lives that changes us. Verse 20, yea, so, ha so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation, but as it is written to whom he was not spoken of they shall see 
and they that have not heard shall understand. So Paul traveled over 1,400 miles in the Roman world, where all, Ro all roads led to Rome, and the language was Koine Greek, wrote most of the New Testament to bring the gospel to people that had never heard it before. He wanted Jesus Christ to come back, and he knew the gospel had to spread around the world. And he said, I'm going to go to the, my known world, and I'm going to tell people about Jesus and set up churches. Paul founded many churches, a lot of the churches, and then he would leave men in charge like Titus and Timothy. He never hindered the ministry of others. Paul never went around bothering any of the work that he started. He only supported it, prayed for it, stopped by every once in a while, and wrote great letters, the word of God. He wrote scripture to edify and to build the church so that we could read these things and we could become strong in the Lord as well. This church right here is based upon Paul's, Paul's writings. We're reading them. Romans. Incredible things that Paul left the church and left us. The problem is, Paul would go and start these churches by the grace of God, and the Holy Spirit would move in, and there would be people that followed Paul to try to hinder his work. And Paul said, I see that. I don't want to be any part of that. I'm not going to do that. There were people that hindered his work. He would go around, teach the gospel, and Judaizers would come behind him, and they would destroy the faith of the people that he just brought to Christ. Would that bother you? It bothered Paul. Galatians 2 says this, and I'll read some for you, just so you'll know. Galatians 2, 4 says this, And that because of false, it means fake brethren, unawares brought in secretly or privately, slipped in, who came privately to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we didn't give a place by subjection. We didn't come under them at all, not even for an hour. We didn't, we didn't tolerate them so that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. The gospel is so important. Many people, even today, spread their false doctrines throughout established churches. They look for crowds that are there so they can slip in. They're fake believers. They're there to divide. They have their own agenda. And they can't find an audience, so they go to a church, and they spread their special revelations. They know better. They should go, I think, and build their own churches based on their own pet doctrines, because we should have the Word of God. And once the Word of God is clearly expounded verse by verse from the pulpit, everybody should understand the Word of God. Then you can make your own decision about what you believe in. I believe in the full Word of God. That's why I go through it. It should challenge you. You should know the truth. The truth will set you free. I don't want to frustrate the grace of God by my own little rules and regulations. This is what he would say in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by faith now. I used to live by religion. I live by faith now. Follows that up with this verse in context. I do not frustrate the grace of God. I don't want to frustrate the grace of God. I want to preach the grace, the goodness, the love of God for sinners. And I want that to go forth. And anybody that comes into a church and tries to frustrate the grace of God with their pet doctrine and bring division, he's going to say, mark them and move away from them. That's what he's going to say here. For if righteousness comes by any other way or by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. So Paul's ministry was subverted, and he said, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go around, I'm going to start new churches. They felt Paul was too gracious, so they went behind him, and they said, you need the law to be saved. Paul went to the lost, started fellowships, he built, he didn't divide, he was, a, he was, a, he was into edifying, amen? It's very important that you do that with one another. You guys do that very well. Um, um, most pastors last two years in a church. I've been here 15 years because you guys basically you edify one another. You love one another. You know the truth. You're well taught, and that's good. We'll talk about that in a minute. You, you need that because I could go nuts. That's a, quite a possibility. <laughs> Verse 22. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you, but now having no more place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come unto you. Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, 
I want to come to you. On my way to Spain, I'm going to stop by and see you guys in Rome. For I trust to see you in my journey and to be brought on my way thitherward by you. I want to be, I want to stop there, be brought on my way to Spain. If at first I might be somewhat filled with your company, I want some fellowship with you. Paul was hindered from coming to them because he was busy reaching 1,400 miles of unchartered territory. He actually says, I have no more place in these parts. I've done my job. He set up churches in all the major cities, and then he left. And he left godly men in charge of them, and he maintained them by visits and letters. Some believe, some believe he even made it to Britain. We can't be sure. Paul was an amazing man. He loved the body of Christ, gave his life for the body of Christ. Um, wonderful, wonderful. Let me read just something for you. Second Corinthians says this about Paul's life, about what he suffered. It says this, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen. He's in peril all the time. In perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watching, he means sleeplessness. He was often sleepless. Oftentimes, he was hungry and thirsty, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, all that things that I suffered without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care or the oversight of all the churches, he felt intimately involved in all the churches that he had started, and he loved the people at each one and he, they came to his mind in prayer he would pray for them an amazing man verse 25 but now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints for it had pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem Gentile believers are opening their pocketbooks to help the poor in Jerusalem it had pleased them verily and their debtors they are for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. These verses are very fascinating to me because these churches gave money to the poor in Jerusalem. God had kind of set those proud people in Jerusalem low, and they were in need of things, and they didn't like the Gentiles. In fact, the Gentile churches probably could have said, I'm not giving anything to those guys. They've been nothing but mean to us. Judy, I was coming around telling us we got to do this and that. They're making, they're making all kinds of trouble. They, 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 they had a contention with them. But instead of putting more wood on that fire, they said, you know what? We're going to take a collection and we're going to love our brothers in Christ and we're going to send that collection down to Jerusalem. We're going to supply the material possessions that they lack. So God humbles the proud and then he uses other believers to bless those churches that are hurting. Now, I don't know about you, I have an easier time sometimes. I have a hard time receiving things, do you? I like to give, I like to give, I like to give. But sometimes God has to humble us so that we can receive from someone. So that we can learn to let somebody edify and build us up. And we can learn that we don't have all the answers. Oh, I've been walking with the Lord a long time, I don't need no help. Well, you know what? Sometimes God will send a new believer along to help you right at that time. To show you that we all need Jesus. Nobody's above anybody else. So this expression of love brought a unity that Jesus wanted and asked us to live out. These Gentiles looked at this offering as paying a debt. They owed these Jews a debt. We all owe the Jews a great debt. We've all received spiritual wealth from the Jews. And I'm kind of tired of some of the church not recognizing that fact. It says we're to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We're to, we're to lay our, 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 our heart out for these people because through these Jews comes the word of God that we hold in our hand. They copied this fastidiously so that what you hold in your hand, you can be sure that it's the very word of God. One letter at a time so that we would know. And not only that, but through them, through the Jews, Jesus was born. The Messiah has come. And now we are all engrafted into that vine of faith. We were taken out, as it were, a wild olive branch, he said in previous chapters, and we were placed into this vine of faith because the Jews didn't receive their Messiah. God said, I'm going to send them to the ends of the earth. And we were engrafted Jews, as it were. You're an engrafted Jew. And once again, God will take that old branch that he put away and he'll engraft it back in again. All the Jews over there that are in Israel right now, I don't care what you say about them, they will remain there until they see Jesus coming again. And they will look on him whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. God will get his glory. He will rule and reign as the prophets say. 
That is a fact. We owe them a great debt. And we should pray for the peace of Jerusalem because when we pray that, we're praying for Jesus Christ to return. Amen? Yeah. We owe them a great debt. So I'm tired of the church boycotting them or saying they don't have a plan in God anymore or replacement theologians. They're out of their minds. God always fulfills his word. He's a God of his word. He's a covenant-keeping God. And if he could dump the Jews, and he can dump you and me. We're just a wild olive branch, by the way. They're going to be easy to put back in, too. Genesis 12, 3 says this, and I don't see any place in Scripture where it's been abrogated. It says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in the first century, they believed that, and they sent their money to the Jews that were in Jerusalem that were hurting. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And we're here today. We are blessed. We are sons and daughters of Abraham, children of faith, looking for a home whose builder and maker is God, engrafted, the very sons and daughters of the Most High God, the bride of the Messiah. And we will always have a special place in God's eye. We, we, we were a mystery hidden before the earth was even formed, a mystery hidden in ages past, but it's now revealed in you, the children of God. Amen? Amen. So we should bless them. We should bless them not throw them away, and not boast against them. We've been blessed, and we should pray for them. Verse 28, when therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. I will stop by when I'm gonna, on my way to Spain. And I'm sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this monetary gift he believed was fruit, a fruit of love to their account. And when he sealed this fruit, he would come to them. So when we give offerings, it becomes fruit. When it is given um, out of love for others, when it is given out of a heart for the Lord. The Holy Spirit is in operation. Generosity is an operation. Amen? Once there's a thermometer up here, I give you full permission to boot me off the stage and find a new pastor. If I have to beg you for money, that means the Holy Spirit's not operating. I'm trying to push that in you and get you to be generous. We'll never ask you for any money. We don't want your money. And if you don't want to put it in cheerfully because you appreciate what goes on here, you appreciate the Sunday school, you appreciate the word of God that's preached here, you appreciate the people, this is your family, and you feel you want to give because the Holy Spirit tells you to, you give what you're able to. You give so much, you'll reap much. That's what the Bible says. I'm not going to tell you what to give. There's not even a 10% commandment in the New Testament to tell you how much to give. You give what the Lord puts on your heart. And if you're blessed, the Lord or the Holy Spirit will work in your heart and we'll always have the money we need to do what we got to do. And once we stop doing what we got to do because there's no money, evidently the Lord and the Holy Spirit's not here anyway and I can't make that happen for you anyhow. Amen? Amen. What am I going to do? Scream, give! <laughs> it's a Holy Spirit thing. So no building funds, nothing like that. Amen. <laughs> I grew up in one of those churches. I got a sore spot. Pray for me. The Spirit of God brings that. Amen. The Spirit of God brings like people together. He built this church. When the Holy Spirit blows in the midst of people, they give to one another. They love one another. You don't always have to put it in the offering plate. You might see somebody walking out of here that's hurting and in need, and you pull money out of your pocket. You got a fruit to your account. Jesus sees that. It's not, just, it's not just a plate that goes around and people dancing and just putting so people can see them. They have their reward. Jesus says, give in secret, and God will reward you openly. Amen. Verse 30 says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, for Jesus' sake, for the love of the Spirit that we all possess. Amen. We're all born again. We're all able ministers of the gospel. That you guys strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Pray for me, and not just pray, strive, press in, to pray strenuously. It could also be wrestling. Put some enthusiasm into your prayer for your pastor. Can I get it? Amen. Amen. I need it. You know, they said Spurgeon, you would go to his church, and he was a very anointed guy, got saved in his young, and he was a pastor a year later. He just blew people away. People say, oh, 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 what's the secret? He would take people down as he was preaching, and he would take them down to the basement, and he would say, after he preached, he said, this is the secret. A hundred people were on their knees praying strenuously for everybody that heard that message that day. Yeah. And that God would, prick and, and that's how revivals start. Yeah. We need you praying. Showing up's good. Showing up and praying's even better. 
You know, because I thank God, I covet your prayers. I need them. I can grow discouraged too. I'm only human. I'm only human. I try to strive and fight for the doctrine that was laid down in the first century by the apostles. I'm the New Testament preacher of the good news. I believe in verbal plenary inspiration of the scripture. And I go a, a line by line because of it. And I, will, I have not failed to teach you all the doctrine. I want to be able to say, like Paul said, I am innocent of any man's blood that came in and heard me on a Sunday morning. I want to say that with a good conscience toward God, so I stick to the scripture. And sometimes I get flack for that. And sometimes I take abuse for that. And sometimes I get upset. And sometimes I'm human. And sometimes it's too hot in my house because my wife puts the thermostat too low. <laughs> but pray for me. There's a balance to ministry. I have a family. My wife works full time. I have two kids that are growing up. One's going to college, work. I got a lawn to mow. I don't know why that comes in my head all the time. <laughs> so ministry is sustained by your prayers. And I know you're praying for us. We, we should pray for each other and each one of us. I know it might be hard to drive here on a Friday night, but pray where you are. Connect together with us and, and pray. Verse 31, that I may be delivered. This is what I want you to pray for. Paul said, I want an on-target prayer. I got three things I want you to pray for. I want to be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. Can I get an amen? amen. Deliver me from unbelievers. And that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. I want the offering that I'm bringing to Jerusalem to be accepted. He's going to bring pastors from the Gentile churches to Jerusalem. Their first trip to Jerusalem, they're meeting where the church started. They're going to meet some of the disciples. Could you imagine if the Jews said, we don't need your offering, Gentiles? He's like, pray that none of that happens when I get there. Pray that it's a smooth transition and these guys I'm bringing there are going to be blessed. And they were. God did that. God answered that prayer. You should pray for that too, that when you get here, see the enemy, when you get here, the enemy wants to put you to sleep right where you are in your chair. Pray against the spirit of sleepiness, <laughs> whatever that is, that you'll be able to love one another. It's also division, discord, anger, upsetment, all that stuff. The enemy's trying to do all that before you get here because he knows the power of the unity of a group of believers who love the Lord Jesus, who were born again by his spirit is insurmountable. The first century was taken over by 12 guys without an education, with the love of Jesus. They wrote the New Testament, and they sealed it in their blood. They died for their faith, and that faith touched countless lives, the risen Christ working in and through us. And the enemy will try everything he can from how hot it is, how cold it is, how you don't like to look at this person, how I can't stand his Philly accent, I don't mind, you know, on and on it goes. I'm not everybody's cup of tea. I get it. So pray for me. Verse 31. And we just did that, that I come unto you, that I may come unto you with joy by the will. So I want the, 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 the offering to be accepted. I want to come unto you with joy by the will of God and, and may be with you refreshed. I want to reach you. I want the will of God to take me and, and, and arrive me in Rome. He's going to arrive him in chains. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. So he asked for three things. He might be delivered from unbelieving Jews. That was answered as Paul, when he gets to Jerusalem, is going to start a riot. They're going to start beating him. Claudius Lysias in Acts chapter 21 is going to come down and rescue him. Amen? God heard his prayer. Heard the prayer of these people. They're going to try to kill him, but he's going to rescue him. And he's going to become a political prisoner. The offering that he brought to Jerusalem was accepted by the Jews, and they appreciated it. And they also uh, put out a council and said, these Gentile churches, we're not going to trouble them with all our nonsense. And they just keep themselves from fornication, from idols, and from things strangled by blood. They'll be do well. Just keep yourself from idolatry and keep yourself from sexual sin and love Jesus. Ain't that hard. What's the biggest problem in the church? Idolatry, sexual sin. Offering was accept accepted. Paul did come to Rome, but he came there in chains. So the Lord answered all his prayers just in his own way and how he does it in his own timing. God, God answers prayer, not always the way we want it to. He got to Rome as a prisoner. Verse, chapter 16. Now, this is an interesting chapter. We're going to get through it all. We're going to finish 27 verses now. But we're going to go through some a little quickly. Paul greets 26 people by name and greets these, these people because most of them belong to home churches and home fellowships. Home fellowships are very important. A group of people that you get together with, that you pray with. 
Wednesday nights at this church, and even Sundays to some most extent, was started when, when I did a Bible study at the WAPS home and my house. We, we switched on and off. And Wednesdays have always stayed, and now we have this church to do Wednesdays in. It was started in home. It was started by people that just gathered together and wanted to go through the word of God. Now, when Paul was in Corinth, he taught them this book of Romans, and he sends greetings from eight believers who were there with him in Corinth where he wrote this letter of Romans from. So as he's going through, they're writing this letter for him, and they're learning these things. Paul's teaching them as he's writing this, this wonderful letter that we have, this record. And I got to tell you this, Paul was not an isolated pastor. He made a lot of friends. He was into relationships. He would stay for a while, make good relationships, install a pastor, and then jet and start another church. That's how he rolled. Paul was not beneath work. He was a tent maker. He was able to go into Corinth when he spread the gospel and he said, I'm not going to take advantage of you like these other preachers that come through because there was a lot of people that had a lot of philosophies that talked a lot of stuff and they came in for money. Paul said, I'm not going to do that. I am going to do it for free and I'm going to work a job. And that's where he hooks up with Priscilla and Aquila, who he's going to introduce to you here in these verses. So he lived a witness wherever he went. Work was not beneath him. And I think many pastors, it, it's, it's a good thing. When I did bivocational, when I was doing for nine, ten years, I learned a lot of lessons, and they were good lessons. You do not take care of a pastor. God takes care of a pastor. That's the lesson I had to learn until I was ready to go full-time. I probably could have gone full-time much earlier, but I didn't trust people until God taught me that lesson. God taught me that lesson. I don't matter when you go full-time. I'll take care of you if there's ten people. But I was weak in the faith, and God let me drive back and forth. And I liked the idea of not being beholden to anybody, that I had a job. And I had a Camaro, too. And I, had, and, <laughs> and I was allowed. I earned that. I earned that money. So people were like, Pastor, I don't think you should have a Camaro. I have a job. Then I became a pastor, and I traded the Camaro in just for optics and bought a pickup truck and got a German Shepherd. <laughs> they weren't cheap either, let me tell you. Anyway. Let me read Proverbs for you before I start telling you about stuff you don't need to hear. 1824 says this, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And through the years as I've been here, I've met a lot of friends and a lot of great people. And God's used so many to blow in and blow out and to help and to edify and to build. And I've watched him build this church and, you know, watch over me through my growing pains and all these things, and God is so faithful. And Paul let the Holy Spirit move. He was definitely in that. And I'm grateful for all the people that uh, um, allowed that in this church too. That's why I'm, I'm very happy, and I, I, I want everybody to use their gifts here, and I pray that you all do. Chapter 16, let's jump in. I commend, you, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Centuria that you receive her in the Lord as become a saint, and that you assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you. He gives her a blank check. For she hath been a succorer. That word means she's a protector of many and of myself also. So an incredible woman. Many people believe she was widowed and she was able to travel. She served the church of Centuria, which was at a seaport in Corinth. She was a deaconess. Literally, that's what it says. A servant, a deaconess. A servant in the early church who wasn't only a deaconess, she protected people. She protected the church. She protected Paul. That means she stuck up for Paul. She wasn't divisive at all. She was edifying and building the church. She was all in. She was a protector of the saints. She was a protector of of the early church, and she carried the only copy of Romans in her hand, and I can guarantee you she had it in a waterproof pouch, and I'm so glad she got it to us. So we wouldn't have this letter if it wasn't for this faithful woman, Phoebe. How important was she? If it wasn't for her, we wouldn't be doing this Bible study. Verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life, for Paul, for owning Paul as their friend, they've laid down their own necks. It wasn't it wasn't always great to be Paul's buddy. Unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. So they not only helped Paul and helped him start his ministry in Corinth, but they had a church in their home. Salute my well-beloved 
Epineatus, who was the first fruits of Achaia. That's in Asia under Christ. He was the first believer in Asia, Epineatus, and he became uh, the first believer of many that followed after him. So we meet Priscilla and Aquila. They were tent makers like Paul. They left Rome under the persecution of Claudius in AD 41 to 54. Paul met them and worked with them on his first missionary trip, and he met them in Corinth. Now, they moved to Ephesus, where they made one whopper of a convert in Apollos, amen? If it wasn't for them, Apollos was teaching the Old Testament. He was a great orator, but he didn't understand the gospel fully. Priscilla and Aquila, a husband and wife team, took him aside. They didn't embarrass him in front of anybody, and they expounded the way of Christ more perfectly. And when the Holy Spirit moved into Apollos, that man rocked the early church. God had plans, and if it wasn't for the Holy Spirit using Priscilla and Aquila, the early church would have been sorely, sorely depleted, but God knows what he's doing, amen? They ministered with Paul. They laid down their own necks for all the churches, a real blessing. They opened up their homes and their lives to the cause of Christ. Verse 6, greet Mary. Now, I'm going to give you some names here. Who bestowed much labor on us. You won't know if I'm saying them right or not. Salute Andronicus. That's the coolest name ever. If I had a son, that's the name. Andronicus. I salute you, Andronicus. I, I will meet Andronicus in heaven. Where's Andronicus? Strength and honor. Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, they were imprisoned with Paul. No doubt they were great friends who were of note among the apostles who also were in Christ before me. So they were Christians before Paul. They were Jews. They were fellow kinsmen, and they were named Andronicus and Junia, and they were in chains with Paul at that time. They had saw the conversion of, of Saul. They saw Saul converted. They watched God take a man that was persecuting them, and the power of the Holy Spirit came into that man, and these two guys got to witness the most amazing convert in all of history, Paul. They followed Paul, and they, Paul wrote most of the New Testament, and these two guys are in chains with him. It's amazing what God can do. They were terrified of Paul. Now they're in chains with Paul. Amazing testimony uh, these guys have. Just incredible, incredible people. Greet Amplius, who are of note among the apostles who also were, with Christ, were in Christ before me. So the apostles knew about them. Verse 8, greet Amplius, my beloved in the Lord. Salute Urbane, our helper in Christ. Stachius, my beloved. Salute Apelles, approved in Christ. Salute or greet them which are of Aristobulus's household. Doesn't say anything about Aristobulus, it just talks about his household. I hope Aristobulus was saved as well. It'd be a shame if his whole household was saved and he wasn't. Amen? Anybody got saved loved ones you want saved at home? Now's a good time to pray for them. Father God, we lift up all, Lord, our unsaved loved ones that we care for so much, Lord. Hate to have a household filled with believers and miss one. So, Father, we pray that Aristobulus is with you now, Lord, and all the Aristobuluses you would gather. Salute Herodian, my kinsmen. Greet them that be of the household of Narcissus, which are in the Lord. Salute Trophina and Trophosa, who labor in the Lord. Salute the beloved Persis, which labored much in the Lord. So imagine having your name in this letter, huh? Be cool. I bet you they didn't know we'd be reading it thousands of years later in the Poconos. But if you want your name, and I'm always jealous of people that get this stuff in the Bible, but if you want your name, remember it. It says this in Malachi 3.16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. So whenever we gather together and we speak about what the Lord has done for us, the, the God of all the universe, how he sent his son and saved us from our sins, and we realize that we deserve hell, but now God has, has shed abroad his grace in our hearts, and the Lord listens to that. He hears it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. So when we gather together every Sunday morning and we think about what the Lord has done for us and the things that he's wrought by his spirit in our lives, we know that God's in heaven stooping down, bending down his ear to listen and to hear and to hear us and to love us and to write our names in a role that never can be expunged from the earth. 
a role in heaven. Verse 13, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, his mother and mine. So Rufus's mother became Paul's mother. Interesting guy. Rufus was the son of Simon the Cyrene, the man that was from North Africa, the man that carried the cross of Christ. He was coming all the way from Africa, probably a once in a lifetime trip to celebrate Passover from North Africa. Cyrene, an African man, coming to celebrate a, 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 a proselyte of the Jewish faith. As soon as he touched that cross, he was unclean. He couldn't celebrate. They took him from the crowd and they put that cross on his back and he carried that cross for Jesus up to Golgotha. And something happened along the way up on that cross. That man really, truly was celebrating the Passover. He got to see the Passover lamb. Amen. And he got to carry the cross for Jesus Christ. And he saw... Jesus and the way he died, probably maybe the first time, or maybe he heard some of his teachings as he was coming in, but he, 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 he saw this man being brutalized, and then he saw him rise from the dead three days later, and this guy rocked the early church, and his family, his whole family got saved. Incredible testimony. Could you imagine, too, if you're Rufus? You could stop an argument in the church at any time. Hey, brethren, who gave you the right to, to tell us what to do? My dad carried the cross. Talk about juice in the early church. Man, you might say, man, I want to take, I always read that story in the Bible and I say, I want to take a time machine and I want to jump in front of Rufus, I mean, I want to jump in front of Simon the Cyrene and I want to take Jesus' cross because I know the story, right? You don't have to get in a time machine. You can pick up your cross every day and follow Jesus. In fact, that's what he tells you to do. Take up your cross, follow me. And sometimes that daily cross is much more difficult than picking up a piece of weight in this world. But the weight of following Christ, the weight of the scorn, the weight of going against the world, that's your cross. Pick it up. Pick it up. Jesus remembers it all. Amazing, amazing testimony. You can do it daily. If any man or woman want to come after me, let him take up his cross and follow me. We can still do it, amen? We don't have to be jealous of Simon the Cyrene and Rufus, as I do when I read these things, fleshly. But I can do it every day. Verse 14, salute the syncretists, Phlegion, Her Hermas, Patrobus, Hermes, and the brethren which are with them. Salute Philologus and Julia. I got it, Julia. Hi, Julia. And Nereus and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints which are with them. Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of, Jesus, of Christ salute you. So they were given holy kisses. Here we do holy hugs. Don't be kissing up on people. <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with that afterward. Pastor, they're kissing people. Make a rule. <sighs> just hug them. Some people don't like hugs. Give them a side hug. They don't like hugs. Just go. <laughs> Give them that guy from the love boat. Be a, be one, now, as you go through this list, I want you to realize something, too. Each one of these people was a protector, a servant, a lover, beloved. The adjectives that Paul uses to describe them, these people loved people. They edified. They didn't cause division. They were behind the program of Jesus Christ, and they wanted to see people come to the Lord. They were behind Paul. They were behind the pastors that they were given. They were behind the work of Jesus Christ. Look at the adjectives, and those are the kind of adjectives I want in front of my name. A protector. Somebody who loved the word. Somebody who loved people. That's what we all want. Verse 17 tells us what to do. Not everyone is like that. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause what? Divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, contrary to the word of God. That's where we get doctrine from, didaxos. And avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ. They're not serving the cause of Christ, but their own appetite, their own agenda. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. So not everybody's working with Paul. Not everybody's working with the doctrine or the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not everybody works. Some people in the church say that we shouldn't even read the epistles of Paul, that only the red letters count. My Bible says all scripture is given by inspiration. Well, Paul wrote that. Yeah, and that's all scripture. 
It's given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man or of, of woman of God may be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Judaizers were following him around and going against the doctrine of grace, going against what Jesus Christ did on the cross and dragging people under an old covenant that God had abolished on the cross. When he died on the cross, he tore the veil in the temple and he said, I don't want no more priesthood. I don't want you going to a man no more. You can go to directly to Jesus Christ. Amen. My job should be putting myself out of a job so you can go to Jesus direct. Amen. You don't need a preacher. You need Jesus. My job is to show you Jesus and get out the way. Pray for me. Others were fleecing the flock of God, deceiving, it says here, the simple with spare speeches, separating them from their money. False teachers who bring in her heresies, who deceive people that don't know the word of God. How do you avoid being deceived in the world? you got to know your word. I am a staunch believer in the Bible, all first century New Testament theology. I'm not, the church has great history and I can glean from it, but let me tell you something. First century Christianity is where it's at. And that's where you want it. You want to know how they interpreted the word of God. You want to know what they, they believed in the return of Jesus Christ. Most of the church doesn't believe in the return of Jesus Christ. And they'll come in and they'll subvert you. Let me give you an example, too. Guess what's not in the Bible? <laughs> Purgatory. Doesn't exist. It's not in the Bible. It's made up. It's made up so that you'll pay the church money and pray for people to get them out of purgatory. It's a money-making scam. It's a deception. Don't believe it. The time for praying is while you're alive, while that person is alive. Once they're dead, the judge of all the earth will do right. When you see a dead body at a funeral, that's supposed to be a wake-up call for you to get your life right because this is happening to you too. A priesthood, we don't need that anymore. The prosperity gospel, it's not in the Bible. In fact, the Bible tells you the exact opposite. It says narrow and difficult is the way that leads to life. People aren't going to like you. They hated Jesus, they're going to hate you. You're going to tell them he's the only way to the Father, and they're going to say, I want another way. They're going to say all kinds of things bad about you. They're going to speak evil of you for his name's sake. You're supposed to rejoice and be exceedingly glad. I'm having a hard time with that, but I'm supposed to do it anyway. That's what the Bible says. So if you're coming to Jesus for your best life now, you're coming to the wrong Jesus. Because Jesus is going to give you your best life for eternity and you're sending treasure ahead. And you're in a battle in this earth. You're supposed to put on a full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. We are fighting a good fight of faith and we are going to win. That's what the Bible says. So if I get up here and I tell you, hey, it's all going to be all right, everything, you're going to get your job back, like playing country music backwards, you're going to get your wife back, everything's going to be great. You're going to have a great time. Just make sure you hit the offering plate twice on the way out. We got credit cards in our teeth. I'm a false teacher. I'm coming with my own agenda. I'm just deceiving you with fair words. And just because I look like Howdy Doody and have a big church in Texas, don't make it true. What does it say? It says, mark them and avoid them. How are you going to know them? They won't teach you the full counsel of God. They won't tell you what the Bible has to say. God says, my word is forever settled in heaven. Not one jot or one tittle is going to pass until it's all fulfilled. I honor my word above my name. All the prophecies in the Bible are yea and amen, and they're all going to come to pass. Thousands of them came to pass when Jesus was here the first time. He rose from the dead, and he's coming back again. Don't let anybody deceive you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to read one more thing. Sec Maybe I should just go on, leave it, at, leave it alone. How about I just beat this dead horse down? <laughs> Second Peter 2 Peter 2.1, because all, all, all Scripture warns you of this. Because you, you can't trust a man. If you do not have the Word of God, now you're trusting a man. If I make you doubt the Word of God in any way, that's Satan. Hath God really said that? I think it might mean this. I think it might be. I'm just shadowing doubt and everything so that you won't know. That's satanic. That's false teaching. 
You need to know the word. The Bible says this, there are false prophets among the people of Israel, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in damnable heresies. They're going to deny Jesus, the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Many people are going to follow their pernicious ways. A lot of people are going to get wrapped up in this stuff, wrapped up in this false teaching, wrapped up in the prosperity gospel. And the reason, by, by reason of, everybody's going to laugh at Christianity because there's no reality in it. It's a show. It's a TV show. And through covetousness, how are you going to know them? They're going to rob you blind. They're going to want to take your money from you. And they're going to, with plastic words, feigned words, plastic, they're going to make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not in their damnation, slumbers not. There's many deceptions. Not even to tell you there's whole religions they make up. If a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, they're telling you Jesus Christ is not God. He's the Archangel Michael. He's a liar. Avoid them. Amen. And and run. Simple as that. The Mormons, they come to your house. They believe Satan and Jesus are brothers and you can get a planet. Right. And run. How do I know that's not true? It's not in the Word of God. Right. All right. Let's move on. 19. Don't worry, we're going to get to the end here. For you obe your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise. You could get bruise or crush. I like crush better. Crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Amen. Guess who wins? <laughs> we do. Amen? Don't be like one of those Christians. I don't know. Satan seems so strong. The New World Order. The Zionist. We're going to crush Satan. That's what my Bible says. I'm into that. Yay and amen. Why is in good things? Stop studying the evil all the time. And I have a tendency to do that. I'm like, you know what they're doing? Ooh. Ooh, Lord, look, it's a conspiracy. Get him. Lord's like, shut up. You're going to crush him under your feet shortly here. Jesus is coming back, amen? amen? That's what he's trying to say. Verse 21, Timotheus, my work fellow, and Lucius, and Jason, and Sosipater. Now, I don't know if I'd name my kid Sosipater. <laughs> my kids, I'm like an Andronicus a lot better. Andronicus, son. Every time I say Andronicus, I say Andronicus. I right, Tertius. There's some crazy names back there. Tertius has to get his name in here. Everybody else gets their name in here. Tertius is like, I'm writing this sucker for you, Paul. I wrote this whole epistle. I wrote this epistle. <laughs> Tertius. Salute you in the Lord. I'm saying hi. Gaius, mine host, and one of the whole church, he's saluting you too. Erasmus, the chamberlain of the city, saluteth you. Cordus, a brother. So even, even the treasurer of the city of Rome got saved. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Eight people send their regards to their fellow believers and commend them to the grace of God. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to the gospel, my gospel that was given to him in the preaching of of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Amen? But it's now revealed, it's now brought into the light by the scriptures. How important are the scriptures? The prophecies of old are brought to light by the manifestation of the children of God. The prophets are vindicated by the fact that we're sitting here today and the light of Jesus Christ has gone to the Gentiles. Amen? That's wonderful. Of the everlasting God, uh, to, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith to God only, wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. That's the longest benediction in all of Paul's letters, the revelation of the mystery, a mystery in the scriptures isn't difficult to understand once it's been revealed. Amen. The church was a mystery hidden in ages past, but is now revealed, is now revealed in the fullness of all that it is. God on the cross reconciling the world unto himself. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free. We are all one in Christ. We're born again by the spirit of Christ. And if the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in your mortal body, he's gonna quicken your mortal body and make you alive. Yeah. Salvation to the ends of the earth. The mystery's revealed. I love it when the mystery's finally revealed. 
That's why you watch, what's, your, what's that? Angela Lansbury, to the end of the show, got to find out. Columbo, got to find out. Well, we already know. We already know who wins. Man, that's like playing with house money. Right? So where, where are you going to put all your money? Where are you going to put all your treasure? If you know you're going to heaven and you're going to win, what are you living for? Send your treasure ahead. Where moth, Jesus was perfectly logical. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be all, also. Send it all ahead. Where moth can't get it, rust can't get it, people can't break in and steal it. It's reserved, an abundant inheritance in heaven, reserved for you, for me. Romans was written by Paul to establish us in truth and to make us stable in the faith and to manifest, to bring to light Jesus and his wonderful plan. Amen? Man. All right, I'm going to stop because I could preach on that for a little while too. And y'all are hungry and hot. You can blame Sean for that, the hot part. The hungry part, I can't blame anybody. Let's stand, we'll pray. And since you guys are the second service and you're filled with Pentecostal love, hold hands while we pray. I would never dare try that with the first service. Shh. Shh. No division in this body. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we lift our hearts to you. Thank you for making us family. Lord, man, it's hot in here, Lord. Thank you for, for your grace and your love in all of our lives, Lord Jesus. Make us a blessing to other people. Lord, if there is anything in any one of our hearts, Lord, we want to get our hearts right before we take communion all week long, Lord. Lord, we bring it to you. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to settle those things in our hearts. Lord, as we gather at your table next week, Lord, Lord, in our marriages, Lord, in our, in our personal relationships with folks, Lord, all the people, Lord, that we know in this church, let us not leave this place without making it right, Lord, and loving each other. Lord, we want, I want those adjectives to be in front of my name when I meet you, Father, a protector of those in the church, somebody who edified and built. So, Lord, please, I pray, pour out your spirit upon us. We need more of you. Thank you for this church, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the record that you left us. Fill us with your spirit. I pray if anyone does not know you in this room, that today they would just walk up front and they would receive you as their Lord and Savior before these next songs are over, I pray.